Hi, I'm Daniel Wicks, and I'm going to tell you about incompressible encodings. Uh, this is joint work with Tal Moran. Let me start with a question. The question is, how much space does it take to store Wikipedia? So it turns out that you can actually download the entire Wikipedia contents for offline use. And uh, depending on which version you get, it can be something like uh, 50 gigabytes. Uh, I think this is for the text only English version. But there's an uh, alternate way of storing the Wikipedia data, which is just to store the link www.wikipedia.org. That only takes about 17 bytes. And with this link, you can access the Wikipedia data whenever you want. And the point I want to make here is that when it comes to some public data like Wikipedia, even though the data can be very large, uh, just by storing the link, uh, you can essentially have this data for free without, uh, without storing it. Um, and the question uh, for this talk is, can we take such public data, let's say the entire Wikipedia contents, and make it incompressible? In other words, can we come up with a representation of the Wikipedia data that would uh, require, let's say, 50 gigabytes of storage to store this representation, even for people that have the link to the underlying Wikipedia data and uh, have access to that for free, don't need to store it. So let me tell you what I actually mean by this. Let me make this precise. And let me get straight to defining uh, this notion of incompressible encodings. So incompressible encoding consists of two algorithms, an encoding algorithm and a decoding algorithm. And the encoding algorithm takes some underlying data M, let's say the uh, underlying Wikipedia data, and encodes it in a probabilistic uh, randomized way to derive some code word C. And here I made the code word, uh, the image of the code word C uh, have some noise or look noisy to, uh, uh, to indicate that it, that it somehow uses randomness to drive this code word. But uh, this code C is essentially a good representation of the Wikipedia data. Anybody can come and decode the code word and recover the original data itself. So storing the code word is as good as storing the underlying uh, data itself. You can think of it as just an alternate randomized representation of the data. Again, I want to emphasize that the encoding and decoding procedures are public, efficient procedures. Anybody can run them. There are no secret keys or public keys or anything like that. Uh, anybody can run these procedures. And we want correctness. So uh, correctness says that whatever message you start with, if you encode it and then decode it, uh, you should get back the original message with probably one where the probability is over the randomness of the encoding procedure. Uh, but we want this encoding to be incompressible. And that means that it should be hard to compress the code word C even for an adversary that knows the underlying data. So we're going to consider an adversary that uh, for whom the data M is public, let's say has access to Wikipedia on the internet. And the goal of the adversary is to take this code word and compress it down. So remember that uh, the code word was created using some randomized process, randomized encoding procedure. So it contains some additional information beyond the Wikipedia data. And the goal here should be that it should be hard to compress the code word itself, this new representation of the Wikipedia data, even for someone that knows the underlying data uh, for free. So the adversary consists of two algorithms, compress and decompress. The compression algorithm takes the code word C and outputs some co uh, compressed value W, uh, which will be of size uh, beta. And the decompression algorithm takes uh, this compressed value W and its goal is to recover the original code word C. And security says that this should be uh, impossible for an efficient adversary to do. So we're gonna say that for any message uh, that you start with and any adversary that consists of this compress and decompress procedures, and notice I'm quantifying over the worst case choice of the message. So this indicates that the adversary could actually have the message hard coded inside it uh, in other words, this message is completely known uh, and we don't pay any anything for storing it, okay? And we're going to say that uh, if we take the message uh, encoded via this probabilistic encoding algorithm, give it to the compress uh, procedure, which I'll put some compressed value of beta bits, and then apply the decompression procedure, then the problem of us getting back the original code word should be negligible. In other words, uh, the problem of the adversary succeeding in compressing this code word and later, later being able to use the compressed value to recover it should be at most uh, negligible. 
Okay, and the goal is to come up with such some scheme where uh, the size of the code word alpha is as close as possible to the original data size. So we don't want to add much overhead. And it should be incompressible, uh, again, almost to the entire uh, code word or data size. So the adversary cannot compress it much, much beyond uh, the, the underlying size of the data. Okay. So uh, let me tell you a little bit about this problem. This problem was actually introduced in prior work, and so I'll tell you a little bit about the prior work and our results. So there's a prior work of Damgard, Ganesh, and Orlandi, and they defined uh, a variant of this notion of incompressible encodings, uh, essentially as a building block to build something called proofs of replicated storage. And I'm not going to get into what these are in this talk. But in this context, they uh, constructed uh, these incompressible encodings albeit with some major caveats. Again, I'll, I'll discuss those later, but uh, one of them is that they, their construction only worked in uh, some idealized model like random Oracle model. And uh, so in our work, the main point of our work is actually to take this notion of incompressible encoding and define it as a standalone object uh, that we believe is interesting to study in its own right. And uh, um, we give new and improved constructions of this primitive. Uh, in particular, we'll show, uh, as we'll see later, we get some constructions in the standard model without a random oracle. We also give some lower bounds and negative results. And we give a new application uh, of this uh, object to something called Vicky cryptography. So a completely different application than the original one uh, to proofs of replicated storage. So let me actually start by uh, giving you this application. I think it'll also, um, illuminate a little more about what these, what the notion is and why it's useful. And then we'll talk about uh, the constructions. So the application is to something called uh, Bicky cryptography. Uh, this is an area that's uh, been studied in the past and it's motivated by the problem that computers can often become compromised um, by various malware, or, uh, Trojan horses or et cetera. And essentially it means that a remote attacker can get access uh, to the compromised computer and if you have any kind of a secret key on this computer, the attacker can just exfiltrate it, can download it, and uh, get the secret key. And so that means that whatever the uh, security of the secret key was providing uh, is completely lost, so the attacker can then, let's say if this was a decryption key, the attacker can uh, decrypt uh, any messages that were encrypted uh, with respect to this key. And a really nice idea to prevent these types of attack is to make secret keys intentionally big. Uh, so instead of having a secret key be like 128 or 256 bits, let's think of a secret key which is 50 gigabytes in size. And the idea is that a 50 gigabyte secret key is difficult to exfiltrate from the compromise system. It's a lot harder to uh, get it out than it would be to take to get a small key out. Maybe there's some firewalls, et cetera, that can detect huge amounts of exfiltration, but wouldn't be able to detect uh, just 128-bit key being, being exfiltrated. And uh, so I want to use an image that's uh, due to Adi Shamir. So uh, Adi had this great analogy. He said, you know, if you want to protect a small diamond, you really need a lot of security. You need to watch it very carefully, have a security team. But uh, Statue of Liberty is also a pretty valuable object. You're not really worried about people stealing the Statue of Liberty because it's very difficult to steal. And so that's the idea. Here we're going to sort of make the key intentionally huge to make it difficult uh, to steal it. Okay, and so this, uh, this idea actually goes back. It's been studied uh, in quite a few cryptographic works. Uh, um, often it's referred to as the bounded retrieval model or big key cryptography. And these crypto systems have two goals. So the first goal is to design a crypto system that has a huge key, 50 gigabytes key, and ensure that security holds even if, uh, let's say, 99% of the key data leaks. So even if 99% of the, uh, even if, let's say, 49 out of 50 gigabytes uh, are, are leaked out of the system, the adversary cannot uh, break the security of the crypto system. And the second goal is to make sure these crypto systems are efficient even though their secret key is huge. So for example, uh, reading, even just reading an entire 50 gigabyte key to like do a cryptographic operation would be really inefficient. So we want to make sure these crypto systems only read a small portion of, of the key in each operation and their overall efficiency should not be much worse than that of standard small key crypto systems that have a 128 or 256 uh, key. So, uh, so there was a lot of work devoted to, to, um, to this idea 
But one problem with all of the prior works is that they require the users to store a huge, uh, let's say, 50 gigabyte key and waste its storage on this on this key. And the key is completely useless for any other reason other than to do cryptography. So you're essentially just wasting storage. And so the new idea in our work is let's make the key useful. Instead of just storing some, making the key random data, let's make the key uh, uh, store something useful like uh, let's say the movie database that a user would store anyway, or maybe an offline version of Wikipedia that the user wants to store for when uh, the user goes offline and wants to still read Wikipedia. So, uh, so the idea is let's make uh, Wikipedia data, let's make the secret key consist of Wikipedia data. Now, is that a good idea? Is Wikipedia a good secret key? Well, no, it's, it's a really terrible idea. Wikipedia is public. Uh, anyone can access it on the internet. So it's a really terrible secret key. Uh, uh, it's really a terrible idea to use Wikipedia as a secret key. Uh, but uh, the, the idea is don't use Wikipedia itself as a secret key. Instead, use an incompressible encoding of Wikipedia. And here uh, you can suddenly see that uh, this starts making a lot more sense. So first of all, there was some randomness that went into making this encoding and therefore the encoding is not predictable. So at least there's a chance of being a, a good key. And moreover, even if the system is compromised and adversary tries to exfiltrate some small amount of data, this incompressible encoding is incompressible. So it ensures that uh, if you use it as a key, the adversary can't steal the entire key by downloading, by exfiltrating some small amount of data from the compromised system. So uh, this tells us at least it has a chance of working. Of course, uh, that's not, we're not done yet. In order to actually make use of this key, we have to design new crypto systems um, that ensure that security holds as long as the attacker doesn't download, uh, doesn't compress the entire key. And we managed to do this. So in our work, we show how to construct uh, public key encryption in this setting. So essentially we construct public encryption scheme where the secret key can be a huge um, uh, incompressible encoding of some public data, incompressible encoding of Wikipedia, and security will hold even if that attacker gets a very large, uh, exfiltrates a large fraction of the encoding size, um, as long as he doesn't exfiltrate enough to be able to uh, recover the encoding, to, to be able to recover the code work. Okay. So that's the new application now work. And now I want to tell you a little bit about the constructions of incompressible encodings, uh, both from our work and from the previous work. So as I mentioned, uh, this problem was uh, originally studied uh, in a work from crypto last year by Damgard, Ganesh, and Orlandi. And they gave a construction in the ideal permutation model, uh, additionally using trapdoor permutations or RSA. Okay, so this was not in the standard model. They assumed they have an ideal permutation which is something that's uh, uh, a little bit stronger than a uh, random oracle. Um, so that's one caveat of their work that they needed ideal permutations. And the other caveat of their work is that the complexity of the encoding process was quadratic in the message size. Um, and this is actually quite a big caveat because we want to apply this to large messages like uh, 50 gigabytes or maybe terabytes in length. Uh, and a quadratic complexity on uh, such large data is uh, uh, really, really inefficient. And lastly, there was one more caveat, which is that the proof of security in that work um, was, uh, uh, was flawed. So we noticed this, uh, that there was uh, serious issues with the security proof, and it seemed to be flawed beyond some simple patch or simple fix. And actually there was a concurrent work, uh, concurrent to ours by Gar, Glue, and Waters. They also noticed that there was a problem with the proof. And uh, uh, they actually managed to fix the proof. I want to give them a shout out. This was not a simple fix. They, uh, it, it really required an entirely new proof and quite a bit of difficult work. So this was actually a, a, a new major new result to, to show that uh, the original construction from the work of Ganesh, Damgar, Ganesh, and Arandi uh, can actually be uh, fixed, can be proven, proven secure. And in doing that, they actually also managed to improve it in one additional way. They managed to replace the ideal trapdoor permutation, uh, ideal permutation with just a random oracle, which is uh, somewhat simpler uh, primitive. So in our work, uh, we give actually a brand new construction of incompressible encodings, different construction. Uh, so, uh, and we managed to give a construction that uh, is provably secure in the common random string model. So we avoid the use of random oracles uh, and we prove it secure under either the learning with errors or decision composite residuosity assumption. Uh, so that's one improvement. We get a construction of the standard model. 
The other improvement is that uh, we improve the complexity from quadratic to linear. As I said earlier, because we're thinking of applying this to big data, uh, this is a significant uh, improvement. Uh, but there are some caveats with this construction. So it actually only achieves selective security, uh, where uh, we assume that the message has to be chosen by the adversary before seeing the CRS. And the CRS size is very long. It's as large as the size of the data we're trying to encode. So if we're trying to encode Wikipedia, it would be, uh, let's say, 50 gigabyte long CRS. And we show that we can remove uh, both of these caveats in the random oracle model. So we go to the random oracle model, then we can get uh, adaptive security. There's no CRS, it's just a random oracle, so we don't, have to, we don't need a long CRS either. So we essentially get the best of all worlds. And this still improves on the previous work by, removing, uh, by improving the complexity from quadratic to linear, even in the random oracle model. And we also give some black box separations to show that these constructions are essentially optimal. So for example, we show that we cannot have provably secure uh, non-trivial constructions of, um, of incompressible encodings in the plane model. And in the CRS model, uh, uh, we actually need to suffer from all of the caveats that our construction has. So the CRS needs to be long and we can only achieve selective security. So this holds for constructions that are provably secure using uh, game-based or falsifiable uh, assumptions. Okay, so uh, let me tell you a little bit about our construction. I'll give you a slightly simplified uh, uh, version of this. And I wanna say that uh, our construction, what, one additional, I would say, benefit of our construction, construction is that it's conceptually very simple and I'll actually be able to even show you um, uh, the proof of security for a slightly simplified version of this construction. So for the simplified version, let's pretend that we have some, a really nice object called a lossy trapdoor permutation. So a lossy trapdoor permutation is like a lossy trapdoor function. So this is a notion due to uh, Pikert and Waters, uh, which is also a permutation. So we're assuming we have a family of functions uh, uh, indexed by some public key PK uh, that maps n bits to n bits. So both the domain and range are n bits. And we can sample the public key in one of two indistinguishable modes. So in the first mode, the function is injective. So this is the standard notion of trapdoor permutations. Uh, you can sample the public key with a trapdoor that allows us to efficiently invert the function at any point. But in the second mode, uh, we can sample the public key in a way that the image size of the function fpk is much, much smaller than the domain 0, 1 to the n. So it's 2 to the little o of n which means that if I give you FPK of X, this loses a lot of information, almost in the, all the information about the input X. So it's very lost. Okay, so using this object, uh, this lossy chapter permutation, let me show you how to construct incompressible encodings in the CRS model. And uh, in this construction, the CRS will consist of some number of random uh, values, uh, uh, n-bit values, you can think of these as outputs of this trapdoor permutation. So this is just a common random string. Now to encode a message m, which we think of as uh, consisting of l blocks each of n, -bit, uh, of n bits each, we're going to sample a random public key along with a trapdoor for the lossy trapdoor permutation in injective mode. And then we're going to invert the trapdoor permutation on the values mi, xor, yi. So we're going to take the message, xor it with the value in the CRS and invert it uh, uh, and output xis, the xis. And that's going to be the encoding. So the encoding is going to consist of the public key and all of these pre-images. And we're going to forget the trapdoor, okay? So the trapdoor was part of the randomness of the encoding process, but the encoding is going to forget it afterwards. And uh, this is efficiently decodable. So if I give you this uh, code word C, you can easily just apply the function in the forward direction on the XI. So you can take FPK of XI, XOR them with the values in the CRS, XOR them with the YIs, and recover the message. So anybody can decode the code word and recover the original data. Okay, and so I wanna give you uh, the proof of security, uh, intuitively very simple. So the adversary in this game sees the common random string and some code word C, which is an encoding of some message M that the adversary knows. And in the original game, the distribution of these two values is that the public key sample injective modes, the YIs in the CRS are uniformly random, 
and the XIs are uh, computed by inverting the function on the message XOR with the CRS. But uh, we can actually think of this distribution in an alternate way, uh, which is completely identical. So actually, this is an identical distribution. Uh, so in this case, think of sampling. So before we were sampling the YIs in the CRS at random and computing the XIs by inverting the, the permutation. Now let's switch it up and sample the XIs uniformly random and compute the YIs by applying the function in the forward direction. So this is exactly the same distribution. Uh, notice the XIs and YIs are individually random in each of the two cases, subject to this relation uh, holding that YI is FPT of XI, X or MI. Okay, so this is the exact same distribution, but uh, syntactically now we're sampling the common random string in a way that depends on the message. So this is something we couldn't have done in the original construction where the CRS was chosen independently of the message. But in this hybrid distribution, we can do that, uh, even though nothing has changed uh, from the distribution perspective. And now we're just going to make the public key lossy. Okay, and this is indistinguishable by the uh, security of the lossy trapdoor permutation. So what's happening now? Now the adversary gets the CRS and the code word under this lossy public key. And notice that the code word has a lot of entropy even given uh, the CRS. Why is that? Because the XI values in the code word are chosen uniformly random, and then we apply a lossy trapdoor permutation on them, uh, which loses a lot of information about the XIs. So actually, even if I give you the CRS, uh, the code word is, has a lot of information theoretic entropy, even for a completely fixed message MI that, uh, that is known in public. And this says that in this hybrid, the code word is actually information theoretically incompressible. Uh, even an unbounded adversary in, this, uh, in the last hybrid cannot compress uh, the code word down uh, to something much smaller than the code word size because it has a lot of real information theoretic entropy. And because it's indistinguishable from the original distribution, it means that no adversary can succeed in compressing the code word also in the original distribution. So that's the entire proof of security. Uh, very, very intuitively simple, uh, simple idea. So uh, last, I want to talk about the instantiation. So unfortunately, we don't have uh, lossy trapdoor permutations uh, that are as beautiful as what I assumed we had, uh, where the domain and range is just 0, 1 to the n. So if you look at known constructions of lossy trapdoor functions, the vast majority of them are not surjective. The output size is bigger than the input size. And in this construction, our construction, we crucially use that we have a surjective function because uh, uh, the honest scheme uh, actually inverted the function at random outputs. Okay, so we cannot use the vast majority of constructions of lossy trapdoor functions because they're not surjective. And, uh, uh, and or they also don't have like nice domains like 0, 1 to the n. Uh, so their domains are much more structured like group elements or something like that. So in our work, we show that we actually don't need to have these beautiful lossy trapdoor permutations. We can do with something uh, a little more relaxed, uh, something we call surjective lossy functions. Uh, so uh, the domain doesn't have to be as nice as 0, 1 to the n. And they do have to be surjective, but they don't actually have to be fully injective. So we relax the injectivity requirements. And we managed to construct these from decision composite residuosity and learning with errors assumption and I want to mention actually the LWE version construction has some uh, interesting new ideas. Uh, so for example, we didn't even know how to construct trapdoor permutations from LWE. So you really need something different than let's say even the random Oracle construction of Damgard, Ganesh, and Orlandi, which, required, which re relied on trapdoor permutations. So here uh, we managed to show something under LWE. It's not quite a trapdoor permutation, but it's something that's as close as possible to a trapdoor permutation. So it's a surjective function where um, the, uh, the domain is not much bigger than the range. So it's surjective, it's a little compressing, but not by much. Um, and uh, this, uh, uh, this is some interesting new idea, so I encourage you to look in the paper. And that's all I wanted to tell you. So thank you very much uh, for your attention. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, I'll be uh, doing, giving this talk live during crypto, and I'm also happy to answer questions by email, so please email me. All right, thank you.